Hello everyone and welcome to another video here on White Coats and Corgis. Today I'm going to be showing you a clip from the Pre-Med Experience, which is a live virtual event that I put together for pre-meds to learn all about the admissions process, the MCAT, how to get their extracurriculars, and all things like that. I was so, so lucky to get three amazing medical school deans to volunteer to participate in the event. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hey everyone, and thanks so much for joining. Uh, my name's Dan, and I am a second year internal medicine resident, and I'll be the moderator for this panel. Um, we're joined by three incredible um, deans and admissions experts here, and um, I wanna give everyone the chance to ask questions in that Q&A, um, and I'll be looking through that. Um, but first, I was hoping that the deans could introduce themselves. We can go one by one and just quickly sort of say where you're from and, and what your role is. So if we can start with Dr. Osborne. Um, hello, I'm Megan Boysen Osborne. I am the Associate Dean for Students. So I oversee admissions, student affairs, and diversity, equity, and inclusion at University of California, Irvine. Awesome. Dr. Liotta. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm Rob Liotta, and I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions and Recruitment at the Uniform Services University, uh, the Health Sciences. And we're actually on the Walter Reed uh, Bethesda Medical Campus, National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda. So, um, and I'm great to be here with you today. And Dr. Amiri. Hi everyone, I'm Layla Amiri. I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions at the Robert Larner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont. Awesome, awesome. Um, and Dr. Osborne, there's actually a question from, uh, from someone named Megan actually, who asks, how can we stand out in our applications and essays when Many of the pre-med experiences are similar. That's a great question. I think a tough question, Megan. So I think that number one, it's good to have all those check boxes like you're, you're talking about. And that makes it so that it's kind of easy to screen your application um, and you know find that you've had some research, had some clinical experience, have met some academic benchmarks that we're looking for as well as shown a commitment to the community. I think I would say that it's different for every single admissions committee member. So I myself, as an admissions um, committee member and as associate dean for students, I don't have any power at all, actually. So I'm just a member of a committee and it would actually be really problematic if I had all the power to decide who comes into medical school and who doesn't. So I leave it up to, the, to my committee. So every single one of my committee members is going to have a little something different that they're kind of looking for. Like, so for example, when I see someone who was a four-year athlete and they were still able to be successful in undergrad with a great GPA, still get some volunteer experience, that's that's like a fun application to me. That's something that kind of stands out and it's exciting. And um, other things that I like love on an application, I love seeing orientation leaders. I don't know why that like excites me so much. Maybe I had a great experience with my orientation leader when I was in college. But I just think that that shows that you're committed to the school that you're going to. You're going to be a fun participant in our medical school. Um, and so I think it, it's not any one thing, but it's just maybe something that you've shown a little bit outside of that clinical or that research experience that was a little something extra. Being in the associate student body, maybe like the student body you know, treasurer or something like that at your college. I love students who are involved in their undergrad institution and are going to show me that they are going to give back. But that's one of many things that could stand out. I think just what's that thing that you're passionate about and do it really well and make that shine in your application. Awesome, thanks. So, and you mentioned a green flag in there. So Dr. Amiri, actually, I wanna ask you about green flags. But um, here, Adriana asks, are there specific um, sort of things that are considered green flags on applications that you look for? Like for example, speaking multiple languages or other things? So, um, you know, the, that example in particular, speaking multiple languages, it's, it's added value, obviously, particularly for, um, you know, an institution that it's in a multicultural setting. Uh, so for the student and the providers to be able to you know, provide care in multiple languages, obviously, is, uh, is a huge benefit. I don't know that I would call that a a green flag. In my mind, a green flag is, you know, this applicant's a no-brainer and we should move forward with them, similar to where a red flag is, you know, we're stopping the application right here. In terms of added value, that's absolutely um, exceptional. I mean, the green flag for me is 
there isn't one particular thing. It's the entirety of the application. So you heard earlier about, you know, make sure that your application is well read and, and all of those things. As a holistic approach to giving a green flag, uh, for me, it is that everything in the application makes sense. Right. So there's a story here and then the story is presented in the personal statement and then what the applicant has done really informed what they had said in their personal statement. And so all of these things are coming together. And this is a this is an individual who's been very intentional, who's been very thoughtful and really um, hasn't grabbed at things because they know these are things that they should have. But they've been selective in that. Um, in that, you know, they know we need clinical experiences. And so what kind of clinical experiences have they looked for? Or we know that leadership is important um, for us. What types of leadership activities have they uh, moved into? So I look for an application that's completely cohesive. And I think one of the panelists said earlier, if you have a major activity, you should try your best to get a letter from that person because they'll know you well. Perfect. And so we have one minute left. And I want to ask one final question for all three of you. And we can go sort of in order from Dr. Amiri to Dr. Liotta, Dr. Osborne. Um, and in about 30 seconds, because we talked about a lot of different things, but in 30 seconds, could you give everybody listening here the one takeaway point that they should remember when it comes to being pre-medical students and applying to medical school from your perspective? The one main point, Dr. Amiri? The one main point will be follow your passion and be yourself. So you're going to get a bunch of idea, uh, suggestions from, from, from different people. Filter that through, take the advice, but see how it fits for you because you're going to be unique in the application process. Awesome. Dr. Leota? Yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Emery. It, it's uh, it's uh, just do what excites you. Don't do what you think you want us to hear do what excites you and then it will shine uh, and uh, and you'll follow those passions and then you're going to be happy. You're going to be happy in medicine because it's what you love uh, and what you love doing. And Dr. Osborne. Uh, I think it's very common for us to be, I'll be happy when type people. I'll be happy when I get into medical school. I'll be happy when I get into residency. I'll be happy when I meet my partner. I'll be happy when I get a house. I'll be happy when I pay off all my loans. I'll be happy when I retire you know what, just be happy now and enjoy this. This is a hard journey and it's stressful and you have to like make sure you're, you know, getting letters of recommendation from the right people, but enjoy it. And especially when you get in medical school, please start living your life as I'll be happy now rather than I'll be happy five years from now. Dr. Dan, can I just say one thing? And uh, I feel bad saying this after this beautiful thing that Dr. Osborne just said, but I was scanning the, the questions. I didn't realize you were okay with us answering the questions. I saw a lot of repeated questions asking if such and such counts towards clinical. You know, don't look to us for that answer. You know, you know what the word clinical means. If you're in a setting that care is being provided and you can understand things from that, then that'll be a clinical environment, right? So, so use your critical thinking set skills, your analytical reasoning skills, take again, general information and, and see how that applies to the thing that you're asking. Because the unique questions that you're asking individually to us may vary from school to school, right? Yeah. And be happy. <laughs> be happy. <laughs> to, to keep going what Dr. Asman said. <laughs>